densely written book and um, Roger doesn't always um, fully explain a particular concept or notion when he introduces it. Against this a kind of compensation, you probably already have realized that, that the same topics keep recurring. So it's a bit like a kind of fugue or a development in, in music. So today I'm going to um, focus on um, chapters two and three. And if you want a kind of keywords, um, I think that the main topics that I'll be considering are the scientific image versus the manifest image, the Lebensfeld, the, the world in which we live, in Roger's characterization of it, and also then what Roger thinks about brain science and, again, to some extent, evolutionary psychology in contrast to his view of persons and the personal and the way that persons hover on the edge of a horizon, as he goes on to argue, where he also places God. I thought I'd begin just by um, reading a nice little passage from the very beginning of chapter two, um, where he really lays out his stall about what, what he's going to be telling us. He says, um, religions focus and amplify the moral sense. They ring fence those aspects of life in which personal responsibilities are rooted, notably sex, family, territory, and law, and they feed into the distinctively human emotions like hope and charity, which lift us above the motives that rule the lives of other animals and come to us to live by culture and not by instinct. So I think you can see already that, that, that there's a great many um, topics there, but the general direction is, is clear that he's going to talk about human beings and the religious aspect of human beings as something that goes beyond the, the material or, or what would be given anyway in materialistic or physicalistic explanations, which is what we'll come on to talk about. Now, um, he sees religion and indeed the human world, the Lebensfeld, as focusing on persons. And obviously a huge amount could be said about what persons are, how we define or, or characterize persons. But for, from Roger's point of view, um, persons are free, rational, unified centers of consciousness, us. And also um, persons live in communities of other persons. And as he will go on to argue, at least some persons reach out to another person beyond the world of um, physical material things. Though that of course is more controversial. And as we'll see, um, Roger himself is, I think, somewhat ambivalent on that, but we'll come back to that. So ha having um, suggested that persons are these free, rational, unified centers of consciousness, um, the question arises, and it's a question that's always or often at the, at the back of Roger's mind, is how do these persons fit into the world of objects, the world which is described and explained and characterized in great detail, in, particularly in physics, but also in the other sciences. So the world of physics is a world in which there are causes and effects, effects follow the causes, even if the causes and effects are linked um, probabilistically, not deterministically, still, um, things follow these, these patterns. And there doesn't seem to be any room in, in, in this physical world for be beings or world of physics, for, for beings which step outside it, can generate their own activity, can be free, rational, and, and uh, these things that Roger has just said. So our question is, um, how do we relate um, the world of physics to the world which we know and live in? And in a way, we, we know it much more basically than um, the world of physics, because it's the world in which we formulate 
what we think and analyze it and act is also the way we, we act. Uh, of course, Roger himself doesn't say this much, but it, for me, the, the personal world, the world of um, people is more fundamental than the world of physics um, because physics itself is um, a construction of people. And if there weren't people, there wouldn't be physics. There would be physical laws, it is true, but, 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 the, but the science itself is something which is produced by persons. So there would be something, I think, dangerously unsettling if we were told, as we often are, and we're going to, going to talk about this a bit in a minute, um, the world of physics tells us that the world of persons is an illusion or unreal or, or secondary or anything like that. Still, um, we still have to um, say something about how these two understandings of the world, the understanding that we have as people and the understanding that we're given in physical science, how do these fit together? Um, one of the things that Roger emphasizes is that what he calls Verstehen, which is a term I think introduced by Dilthey, a German philosopher around the turn of the 20th century, Verstehen uh, understanding contrasted with scientific explanation. Um, th and in the world of Verstehen, um, we are not just people, but we are interacting all the time with other people and we engage in symbolic actions and actions that have meanings which go outside anything that is conveyed in the language or explanations of physics. And I could just refer here again, which I mentioned last time, to Fraser, Sir James Fraser's Golden Bough, um, the great, this great um, collection of anthropological tales and stories. Now, uh, I mentioned that v Wittgenstein was very critical of, of Fraser because he thinks that, correctly actually, that, that Fraser sees religion as a form of primitive science, a, a type of magic by which people try to manipulate the physical world. And Wittgenstein's point, which, which Roger would very much warm to, is, is that in the rituals which Fraser describes, um, they do not sound like scientific experiments failed or otherwise. And we can look at the very beginning of the Golden Bough where Fraser describes what is going on at the Lake of Nemi near Rome, and it's in a famous painting as well by, by Turner, where there's a tree, um, an oak tree, and that's where the Golden Bough is, the tree sacred to Zeus or Jupiter, and round this tree there lurks, and it's a very good description by Fraser actually, a man, a sinister man who is a priest, a king, and a murderer. I, I won't go on with the description, but already you're, you're clearly getting a sense of something primeval, something archetypical, something deeply human, something emo emotional, something with symbolic meaning that is not at all like what Fraser says it is. So that, that's just an, an example of the contrast between the kind of picture we get in Verstehen, personal understanding, and the scientific sort of explanation. Now, the American philosopher Wilfred Sellers made a, a famous distinction um, between, uh, relevant to all this, between what Sellers calls the scientific image and the manifest image. The scientific image is the image we get in um, physics. And, and let, let's not beat about the bush. Science is always going to go down to physics. Um, and, and, and that's where the, that, that, that's really where the action is. Um, so that's why modern materialists in philosophy are called physicalists. It's not just that they're, it's not that they're physical, it's that they believe in physics as being the ultimate sort of explanation. So in, in physics, the, any, everything to do with secondary qualities, with um, sight, well, no, with, with colour, um, hearing, what sounds we hear, touch, taste, and, and obviously all the, the, the feelings and emotions, none of them play any role in the explanations of physics. Physics tries to explain these other things in its own terms, and to some extent tries to explain them away. There's a great tendency in the physic 
holistic explanations, as in other scientific explanations, to say that something or other is nothing but. So colour is nothing but um, light waves interacting with our eyes. It doesn't really exist in the world, nothing but. Altruism, I'm going to come on to, is nothing but people um, exercising tit for tat, um, simply promoting their own ends under a kind of um, veneer of um, caring for others. Um, as well as, but so, so for sellers, the, the scientific image is, is, is the, the image of physics, the manifest image is, is the, the world in which we live and move and have our being, as it were. We could also refer at this point to um, Peter Strawson, uh, the greater Strawson, P.F. Strawson's um, famous article, Freedom and Resentment, in which Strawson doesn't try to justify our notions of freedom, responsibility, and so on, but he says that these are integral to our lives and we can't live without them. Whether we can make sense of them or not, we have them, we have to have them. So that's, that's Strawson, I think the article was in 1961, a long time ago. Roger himself, bu building on Sellers and Strawson, um, makes a distinction, or, or, or yeah, which is a distinction, um, which, which he calls cognitive dualism. And, and this is a topic which will haunt us throughout the rest of um, these sessions. Cognitive dualism means that we think of one world, so it's not ontological dualism, we think of one world in two ways, with two perspectives. And the two are, you know, a la Sellers, um, they're the scientific way and what Sellers calls the manifest way. And on page 36 of um, The Soul of the World, Roger says that science, that, that is in the cognitive dualism distinction, the scientific side of this dualism, dualism two things, the scientific side has explanatory priority. That's his phrase. Well, explanatory because science explains, it tells us about causes. The other side of it, although there are explanations involved, it's much more about reasons, justifications, feelings, um, how we think, how things have meaning for us. In a sense, there's no meaning in the scientific world. Things just happen, just one damn thing after another. And there's, there's no kind of intervention of um, creatures with meaning that are pushing this, this along. Um, it, it's, in the case of human beings, it's neurons, but ultimately it's particles, subatomic physics, all, all, all that jazz. Um, so that, that's what Roger means, though he may mean more, when he says that science has explanatory priority. It doesn't mean there aren't explanations in the other world, but there are explanations of a different sort explanations subject to um, criteria of meaning and uh, rationality and justification in that sense. Roger says that the Lebensfeld, that is the world of the manifest image, the world of freedom and resentment in, in Strawson's terms, the space of reasons, this emerges from the um, world of physics. And he, he gives uh, an example here on, on page 37 of Beethoven's third piano concerto, um, one of his favorite pieces of music. And he argues that we can look at Beethoven's third piano concerto in acoustic terms, simply as a set of sounds in physical space with their own wavelength and interacting with our um, um, ears and eardrums and you know, clanking into our brain and so on, we can give that sort of explanation. But that won't tell us anything about what the music is, what it means. Music is not just sounds. It, 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 is, it exists in what Roger calls an acousmatic realm, where there are sounds, of course, but there are sounds that are linked with their own meanings, intentionality, the, the weight of one against another, the, the contrast between one another, the, the way things come back. And 
uh, although he doesn't say this here, it, it's almost in music, it's like you're interacting, the music is like interacting with a person. It has all kinds of um, emphases, feelings, logic, um, contrasts and so on that you get when you interact with a person. That's what you get in the acousmatic world, which is the world in which we all listen to music. Of course, we can also um, analyze it in physical terms and that's not false, but it doesn't tell us what the music means. And another example, which Roger often uses, is a painting. Um, and he often talks about the Mona Lisa, but I mean, it could apply to any painting. You can analyze the painting in terms of its pigments, um, the blobs of paint, the, the, the chemical underpinning of them, maybe how you know, animal fat is used in, in the um, underlying preparing of the pigment, uh, sorry, the canvas and so on and so forth. You, you can analyze it all in those terms, but, but that's not the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is La Gioconda, this strange person, timeless, as Walter Pater says, et cetera, et cetera that somehow holds us. We're in a different world. Um, so again, um, something that is physical has a completely different level of meaning and feeling. And it is, of course, correct. It is not just pigments. It is pig pigments, but it's not just pigments. The third piano concerto is not just um, uh, sound waves, it is everything that it means to us. Now, ha having sort of laid out his stall in this way, you, you might think that, that Roger would be tempted to move into Cartesian dualism. That is where the human being consists of two things, mind and, uh, sorry, yeah, mind and matter. Mind being separate from matter, two separate substances. It's Cartesian dualism, ontological dualism, if you like. Um, but Roger is very resistant to this um, and to this form of dualism where the, the mind is conceived as something that I know far more intensely and privately than I know other things. And other people's minds are in a way closed off from me because they're within their own um, closed off selves. That's the kind of Cartesian, well, it's actually not really Descartes' picture, but, but that, that, that's how it's often presented. Um, and Roger resists this um, for two reasons, really, um, or two reasons that he states here. One is um, based on Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein is one of the people that influenced Roger the most, along with Kant. Wittgenstein's private language argument um, which is very difficult and controversial, but the basic point is that, of, of Wittgenstein's private language argument, and, and perhaps all we need to say here at the moment, is that these private um, states, psychological states that I have, you know, my thoughts, my feelings, um, my emotions, my passions, um, these things, are rooted, and my understanding of them is rooted in public discourse. So although I do know things about myself, thank God that you lot don't know and nobody knows, um, um, still what I know, I know because I speak a public language. I speak about my sins and I know what sins, guilt, shame, all these things are and I of course can see how they apply to me, but other things too. I'm not, I'm not completely miserable. Um, so the private language argument tries to show that um, you can only refer to these internal states if you already are speaking a public language which allows you to identify and um, uh, think about the, 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 these, these, these states. Another point of it is that, that when, when you ascribe um, an emotion to somebody, like particularly like pain or, or some you know, some enthusiasm they have. You don't think, you, you, you know it immediately from their behavior. You, you don't have to sort of analogize from your internal state to theirs. All this is already in, in the public world. So that's the first kind of reason that, that sorry, that Scruton Roger gives against 
Cartesian um, dualism, that this internal world is itself rooted in the external public world. And going on for that, the second reason is that he says quite obviously that intentional states, these internal states, are had by physical beings, us, you know, that, that we're not just souls, we're, we're persons, we're physical beings who live in communities. But we are beings who can recognize others as you. I don't just think of you as a physical object, and this is very much the point that Strawson makes in Freedom and Resentment. I think of you as a person. I see you as having feelings. I see you as um, having things that or having qualities which I like or dislike, resentment, I resent some things, I praise other things, um, I blame people, I reward people, and I treat, you know, we all treat each other in, in these ways, which is, of course, going um, way beyond anything that is um, given to us in physics or in science. So we live in a world in which we an I thou world, one, one could say, and in the I thou world, um, the beings who live in it um, have specific authority, they have responsibility, and they interact with others who they see in the same way, ourselves. Now, in, I'm not, now going to deal more briefly with the third chapter, I'm really getting near the amount of time that I really want to talk. Um, the third chapter, Roger considers brain science um, and he's very critical of brain science perhaps not as critical as he should be um, and he's particularly critical of the philosophical attempt to um, analyze human behavior in terms of brain science and he begins by referring to four thinkers um, whom he and I would want to convict of these um, fallacies. Um, I've just mentioned them because um, each, each of them is important for our purposes. Paul Churchland, Daniel Dennett, Matt Ridley and Axelrod. Now Paul Churchland is um, a physicalist, a very thoroughgoing physicalist. He thinks that we are just physical atoms in a particular sort of combination, nothing more than that. And if you ask Churchland about, well, what about the manifest image, you know, the way we talk, uh, Churchland says, if you really knew what was going on, you could explain everything that happened about you, me, everybody else, um, in terms of physics, you know, just slam down the laws of physics to, and work out what state all your atoms and neurons are in, and then you'll be able to predict what, what will happen next. Um, you know, you know, you'll probably fall asleep listening to me, but that, that's all predictable. Um, and the talk that, that I've said is actually primary, the talk of human thoughts, feelings, reasons, meaning, and so on, all that is, according to Churchland, folk psychology. Daniel Dennett wrote a book which was mistitled Consciousness Explained because he tries to explain consciousness away. He says more or less it's an illusion, consciousness is an illusion, and the way we talk about each other is helpful. He calls this the intentional stance. It's helpful for making predictions, but it's actually analyzable, reducible to physics. So, so there are two extreme um, types of the sort of um, explanation that Roger will reject, explaining um, human feelings, human meanings away in terms of science. Ridley and Axelrod um, want to explain um, morality in terms of evolutionary psychology, which, which we touched on last time. Um, and evolutionary psychology will try to analyze our intentional states, particularly moral states and perhaps um, our sense of beauty and things, which they don't deny, but they want to explain these things in terms of um, uh, Darwinian survival, and also they introduce the notion of sexual selection. So sexual selection is when um, creatures, um, when, when certain qualities, sorry, in creatures are preferred by their potential mates. 
So that, that's the explanation of the peacock's tail, which, which, which we see as beautiful and maybe in a sense the peahen sees as beautiful, but she's doing that simply because um, the peacock with this luxuriant tail is the better one to mate with, so she mates with him and then has more peacocks with luxuriant tails who, and so on and so forth. You can see how the story is going to go. We can come back to that. I'm, I'm not, not going to go into that much now. I'm going to say what's wrong with brain science. What's wrong with brain science is that it commits what um, Peter Hacker calls the myriological fallacy. And the myriological fallacy is a fallacy of misplacing something, meros coming from the Greek from, for place. It places in the brain things which qualities, abilities, facilities, which are only properly ascribable to persons. So, for example, um, take any um, mental concept you like, like remembering. So the brain scientists will tell you, I mean, not all brain scientists, they don't all do this, but the ones that want to explain human action purely in terms of um, brain functioning, they will say remembering is just activity in your brain at a certain point, you know, there and there and there. That, and that's your memory. Your memory, and your memory is probably a little... Um, trace somewhere in there. Or your calculating is simply computer jazz whirring away the neurons inside your brain. According to Hacker, and I agree, I agree with Hacker and, and Roger does too, this is completely wrong because it is persons who remember, who calculate, who have feelings, and persons are not brains. Of course, brains are a very important part of persons, but it is only, em I'm going to invent a phrase, empersoned brains that, can't, that can do any of these things. If you just put, stuck a brain on a, on a tray, you wouldn't have any of these things. It, it's only when the brain is part of a person and then a person is in this community of similarly acting persons that you have any of the mental states that the brain scientists um, misplace inside the brain. That's the myriological fallacy. And Roger, again, um, I just point this out because it's important, he stresses self-consciousness um, in terms of persons. Um, animals have feelings, animals are conscious, I think. Um, against Descartes. I mean, I think um, if you kick a dog, which I hope you don't, um, you're not just kicking a mindless machine or a, something that doesn't feel. So animals certainly have feelings, but they don't have the type of self-consciousness, this is Roger's view, which we have, which allows us to reflect on ourselves and what we do and to examine it in terms of reasons and meanings. This is something that arises only in the human world, um, in the world of others and the world of language, the Lebensfeld, um, which he talks about on page 66. I'll just mention only to dismiss something which impresses, over impresses a lot of people, um, and Roger does mention it, I'm afraid. Um, this, these are the experiments of Benjamin Liebet that are supposed to show that there isn't such, well, Liebert actually thinks it does show that there is such a thing as free will, but many people have interpreted his experiments to show that there isn't such a thing as free will because in certain experimental circumstances, analyzing the brain, um, you can show that before people make a pre, in fact, it's a predetermined choice, they, they know what choice they've got to make, it's whether to press a button or not, they make a certain predetermined choice. Before they make that chase, choice, there's a lot of activity in the brain which they're not conscious of. That, that, that's what the experiment is supposed to show. Now, aside from the fact that um, this is a thoroughly artificial experimental situation, one can criticize um, this as throwing any light on free will at all, because when we talk about human freedom, we're not talking about um, states which precede actions. We're talking about actions and how those actions are to be conceived in the human world. So 
if, if I freely pick up my watch, as I've just done, um, you, you see that as free because it is something done by a human person not being caused to do it by other people. We don't have to invoke any decision, even of a mental sort, that um, uh, came before the action which I would count as free, or you would count as free. I mean, there may be decisions, decision processes, but often in our actions, they're not. So it, to, to think that every free action has to be preceded by a moment of choice, in the sense that Liebet's experiments seem to suggest, that's to misconstrue free action, apart from the more general criticism of it, that Liebet, in looking at the uh, uh, action in terms of what goes on in the brain, as opposed to what a person is doing, is um, uh, misconstrued, he's, he's committing the myriological fallacy. He's talking about bra brains or what goes on in the brain in terms that should only be applied to persons. Now, Roger, I just going to end now, makes a, some religious connect, connections here at the end of chapter three. Um, he says that just as persons are not to be found in the physical world, even as described in brain science, they're to be found in the Lebensfeld and in that side of the cognitive dualism distinction, um, God's presence in the world, this is page 70, when he's just discussed Liebet, he says there is a parallel here with the question that I raised in the first chapter, chapter, the question of God's presence in the world. If you look on the world with the eyes of science, so this is now um, moving from what he says about the person to religion, he says, if you look on the world with the eyes of science, it is impossible to find the place, the time, or the particular sequence of events that can be interpreted as showing God's presence. God disappears from the world as soon as we address it with the why of explanation. Just as human persons disappear from the world when we look for the neurological explanation of their acts. And he goes on to argue that we never find the subject, me, you, the people we, we love, deal with, hate, compete with, etc., etc., talk to, joke with. Et we never find these subjects in the world of objects. I address you and other people, he says, and each other from what he calls transcendental horizons on the edge of the physical. And this leads to perspectives which are absent from those of science, which can say nothing about responsibility and freedom, um, except to try to explain it away. And also he's going to argue, or does argue, that God also is on the transcendental edge of the world beyond the horizons of science. So sorry, I've gone on longer than I should have, but I will now stop. <laughs>